Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome for familiar folks here. Welcome for new faces as well and friends online. I'm Eve Ekman. I realize I, I almost never introduced myself, um, which feels a little rude. So I'm Eve Ekman. Really happy to be here with you all. Uh, this is uh, a night I think has been going on almost seven years now um, with Lopan Chandra Easton and myself. And us really connecting with a variety of different texts and giving ourselves an opportunity to come together and do practice. And in this case, really like storytelling, come on in. Um, and as we go through this book, it just... I don't know. It doesn't matter if it's your first night with this book or if you've been tracking the whole time. I feel like it's, um, yeah, just such a beautiful way to connect with the Buddhist practice and with meditation. So <clears throat> for folks who don't know, this book is Old Path, White Clouds, and it's a compiled um, series of stories put together by the beautiful late, great Thich Nhat Hanh. And he weaves together these historical ideas about what we know of the Buddha and how he lived in his time. <clears throat> and I think it's really interesting because for each of us, we get this opportunity to think about what in our own life is accelerating or obstructing our awakening. A lot of the first part of the book that we've already been through was how he was recognizing and getting clearer on what was in the way of waking up or what to him seemed so clearly unfair or unjust in the world around him. And then how he, with a lot of effort, uh, extracted himself from the responsibilities of his world and his life, arguably sometimes not in the best way, like with his one-year-old child, um, but he was able to um, dedicate himself completely to his practice and use everything that was happening for him as kind of fuel for awakening. And we've spent now the last three weeks on the night of his awakening because it's just <laughs> so rich and beautiful. And I, um, I think it's just been really wonderful for us to really slow down and pay attention. If he's waking up from ignorance, what do we mean by ignorance? Um, and this evening, I feel pretty sure that we're going to get through to the awakening. Um, we're very close and we're going to start with a practice and then discussion and I want to read just one quote from what we'll be covering tonight. And it really has inspired me that we should do a Tonglen practice together tonight. So I'll give a little bit of preamble on that and we can engage in that compassion practice. But this part of the reading tonight really inspired this. And it says that Siddhartha now saw that understanding and love are one. Without understanding, there can be no love. Each person's disposition is the result of physical, emotional, and social conditions. When we understand this, we cannot hate even a person who behaves cruelly, but we can strive to help them transform his or her physical, emotional, and social conditions. Understanding gives rise to compassion and love, which in turn gives rise to correct action. In order to love, it is necessary to understand. So understanding is the key to liberation. Just, I love the, the, the combination of those three pieces of understanding and love and liberation. And I think Tonglen practice is a really nice practice that brings those together. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, or even if you have to kind of refresh your memory and experience of it. This Tonglen practice is a practice of giving and receiving. It's one that's traditionally done when we really feel like we want to be able to relieve the burden in a way of others suffering and not relieve it as in take it on for our own, but as in invite it in, transform it, and then extend it back out. It's really interesting. It's this idea that there is so much force or energy or power at our heart center that it can act as this dissolution of this difficulty. Another thing I, I think is really powerful about the Tonglen practice is the use of visualization. 
So visualization is such an interesting way to engage our imagination and use it for practice. Often, if we're focusing on the breath or the body, there's no visualization involved, right? It's just our experience. But when we're bringing visualization into our practice, it can really help us focus. Um, so it's really lovely to have a practice where we're bringing to mind and really imagining and then transforming this imaginary content into either a dark cloud or dark smoke. So we imagine the difficulties in our own life or others in that way. And we also imagine a sense of real radiance at the heart. So this is a, it's interesting, right? And if it's the first time you're doing this practice, it might be a little funny, right? Like we're imagining dark clouds and bright light. And my invitation to you is to be open and consider what it feels like to bring forth this imagination. Um, I think it can be a really useful tool for training our attention, helping us kind of tether our mind and our heart in one place. So if you're, again, feeling a sense of, I've never done this, I'm not sure, try it as an experiment. Notice what it does to the heart and the mind and the body in trying to bring forth visualization. For some of us, visualization is a lot easier and for others, it's harder, no problem. If it is, you know, like you're imagining the smoke, but it's kind of dull or, you know, not that vivid, it's okay, not a problem at all. It is interesting, I mentioned this last week, but there's such great research right now on how efficacious imagination can be. So imagining compassion, can set forth the same kind of potentiality uh, neurologically as our actions of compassion. So it's often said that it creates a readiness for compassion. So we can use this practice of imagining alleviating suffering as a training ground for alleviating suffering. So that's my always a little too long preamble before practice. So please find a posture that is compassionate to yourself. So that could be one, of course, of, you know, sitting cross-legged. That could be standing. And a posture that really can give you the best opportunity to find some stillness in the body. Not because moving or fidgeting is bad or wrong in any way. But because when we have stillness in the body, that stillness can really help us find a stillness in our mind. So feeling ourselves supported by a cushion or the chair beneath us. We invite the lengthening of the spine upwards. And feel the head gently resting on top of the neck. And checking in that the head's not tipping too far forward or sloping backwards. And the eyes can be closed or gently open with a soft focus. And see if you can feel or imagine just a slight upward turn of the chest as though the heart were facing upward. And checking in to see that the belly can flow easily with the breath. If there's a button that needs to be loosened or some way to give yourself that full sense of breath, 
traveling to the belly, expanding and gently falling. So to help settle our body into a natural state of stability and stillness, invite a sense of relaxation through all the muscles in the face, relaxing and releasing tension between the brows and around the eyes. Relaxing and releasing through the cheekbones and the jaw. And then kindly, with curiosity, <clears throat> really notice the sensations in the face. There might be built up residue from the day, achiness of the eyes or tension around the mouth. And without forcing anything or a particular agenda, just invite some gentleness, softness throughout the entire face and neck. And continuing to pour this kind and curious attention through the body. Noticing and being curious about sensations in the chest, the shoulders, the upper back. Inviting gentleness through the arms the shoulders and the forearms, the hands and the palms. And as we're feeling into these areas of the body, as much as possible, feel the body from within the body, not looking down upon it, but experiencing it. And bringing this kind and curious attention from within. Noticing and being curious around the belly.
Mm, feeling into the buttocks, the legs, through the thighs and the knees, the shins and the calves. On top of the feet and the soles of the feet. And then feel your breath breathing the whole body. Breathing in, aware of sensations throughout the body. Breathing out, aware of sensations throughout the body. Whenever a sound or distracting thought arises, <clears throat> see if you can find a moment even of rejoicing. And then returning to just focusing on this experience of breathing in the body. If the thoughts feel like they're just rushing very fast, focus a bit more on the exhale and relaxing. If you're experiencing dullness or tiredness, bring a bit more attention to the inhale, invite a vividness. Just continue this breathing, feeling the whole body through each breath. And to help us further steady our mind, we'll do a brief course of counting the breaths. So on the very top of the inhale, silently to ourselves, simply say one, and then exhale. And as we exhale, we're not still thinking about the one, fully engaged back in the breath using the counting just to help punctuate and refine our attention and doing this counting up until 10 and then starting again. If you become distracted at any point, no problem. And start right back again at one. Inhaling, silently saying the number and exhaling. Releasing.
wherever you are and you're counting, just gently release and come back to the body and the breath for a moment or two longer. We'll gently shift our attention and awareness now away from the body and breathing to our mind and imagination. As we enter into this Tonglen practice, there's a classic instruction that we flash upon emptiness. Remember that everything is coming and going. It can also be very helpful to have a sense of our own heart's capacity. <clears throat> Taking a moment to consider all the love that we have extended in our life. All the people who have come and gone, all the people who remain, with whom we've gotten to share our care, our kindness, our support. Maybe our heart has been broken by others in that process, and yet it reconstitutes. There seems to be more care, more love. Feeling that elasticity, that strength at the heart center. And imagining all the love we have received in this lifetime. Again, from some beings who are no longer here or no longer in our sphere. A sense of the strength which all that love we have received in this lifetime has provided to this heart. It is classically said that our compassion can be boundless. And see and feel if you can touch into that sense of boundless potential of love, care, compassion. Maybe we experience this as a warmth at the heart, maybe as a light at the heart. This could be a golden color or a white color. And the sense of radiance, as though it were sparkling like a sun through the clouds. This innate, intrinsic capacity of care and love, it's our birthright.
in this practice, we endeavor to use this light and this radiance to imagine taking off some of the burden, challenge and difficulty of other beings. And we can begin with our own heart. Some of the things that are burdening our own heart in this moment. Something we need to bring this loving understanding towards. <clears throat> there could be a particular situation or person. It could just be an overall feeling of heaviness, emptiness, loneliness, overwhelm. But taking a moment and really considering what might be a feeling of heaviness or burden on our heart. And imagine that we could pour it out of our heart. And as we poured it out, it became this swirling cloud of dark smoke hovering in front of our belly. And as we symbolically imagine these challenges and difficulties there, we let that radiant heart of compassion feel pulled and called to really be extended and to hold with care and concern our own heart's burden. On our next breath, we symbolically bring in this dark smoke, imagining it just touching that light at the heart center through our inhale. And then as we exhale, we radiate out, alleviating the smoke and extending instead the sense of care in all directions. Inhale, imagine drawing that smoke towards the radiance of our heart. And exhale with this wish and care of compassion. May I be free from suffering. May my burden be lightened. It's okay if it feels hard to do this. And it's okay if it feels full to do this. For a while here, we're just going to practice with bringing in this dark smoke, compassionately meeting it, and extending it out clear, open. Checking in and making sure you're really in your whole body as you're doing this. Not just thinking it, but really feeling a sense of the breath moving through. Of this transmutation. Through compassion of what is difficult. Into a sense of beautiful, kind, caring, light.
Now imagine taking the last tendrils of that smoke and drawing it into the heart, extending it out. And taking a moment to return to that radiance of the heart, returning to that sense of boundlessness, presence, love. Notice how it feels in the body. Be this body of compassion. Then gently inviting ourselves to again engage with memory and imagination and considering someone in our life who could really use this compassion. Someone who is struggling, has difficulties. There might be many people uh, try to just choose one so that you can vividly bring them to mind. And imagine their heart and the burden and heaviness of their heart. And again, imagine that they could pour out the heaviness and burden of their heart. And it again would swirl into this little cloud of dark smoke in front of you. Imagine the possibility of supporting and loving this difficulty. Imagining and caring for this burden. And again, as though this very practice were a training ground for the compassion we want to embody in our life. With that level of engagement, and maybe enthusiasm, slowly begin drawing in these dark tendrils of smoke to the radiance at our heart. And as we exhale, imagine extending out this clear, loving light, imagining this being free, imagining this being relieved of their burden. giving ourselves here this time to really focus our loving attention, our kindness and compassion towards this being, breath by breath. And really checking in here, keeping a sense of strength at the heart. Continuing to make real this burden and suffering of another being. And for a couple more breaths, just inviting in. Receiving the difficulty and burden. 
And then offering compassion and love. One or two remaining breaths. Last tendrils of smoke. And gently letting the image of this person recede into the background. And taking a moment again to recalibrate our sense of being in the body. Re-infuse our connection with the heart, compassion. And then in our last round of Tonglen, we bring to mind not just a person we know, but we can bring to mind a part of the world, a group of people. People we don't know, maybe we've never seen, but who it is clear they are suffering from natural disaster or war, from being unsheltered, stigmatized or otherwise oppressed. And as we hold ourselves in a compassionate connection, we do so with this delicate balance, that flash of emptiness, remembering that our care and our compassion is boundless. And suffering too is boundless, but always changing. Inviting ourselves to care deeply without feeling a sense of overwhelm, without taking it on as ours, extending our heart, opening our heart. And bring to mind this group of people you'd like to dedicate this practice to. You'd like to train the mind and heart with compassion. Bring them to mind vividly. Of course, you may not know their faces, but consider the challenges and difficulties that may be faced. And again, imagining relieving the burden, inviting this pouring out of challenges or difficulties into that swirling cloud of smoke. Feel the generosity of this intention and aspiration, the generosity of this visualizing practice. And with the consideration of these beings in mind, once again, engaging in the practice, drawing in these tendrils of smoke and exhaling this heartfelt aspiration of compassion. May these beings be free. May these beings be alleviated from their suffering, difficulties. May they be healthy and strong. And feeling this body as a perfect vessel for compassion. The strong back and the soft front. The radiance of the heart. 
Inhaling these tendrils of smoke in, exhale, extending out with a wish of compassion, transformation. It's okay if it isn't feeling like it's stirring the heart and it's okay if the heart feels very stirred. Just a couple more breaths here of practicing this invitation of inviting in the difficulty and challenge of other beings unknown in this world and meeting it with this radiant compassion. Just a couple more breaths here, these remaining tendrils. And then releasing the image of other beings and returning to the breath and the body feeling a sense of this whole body breathing through the inhale and the exhale. Thank you for your practice. We haven't done Tonglen in a while. When we were doing the Lojong slogans, we were doing probably Tonglen every other week, settling the mind. <clears throat> it's a beautiful practice. <clears throat> Before we <clears throat> get into questions and answers, just want to remind those of us who know and invite those of us who may be new, <clears throat> excuse me, that in the San Francisco Dharma Collective, we really are a, a volunteer run space, a community space. 
And the meditation is an essential part of what we do, as are the teachings that we read. But almost as essential, arguably more essential, is the discussion and connection and reflection. And that can be tricky, right? If we don't all know each other, um, if we are maybe coming here with some heaviness of what's happened before in our day or our week. And so really inviting us as we are both listening and speaking, as we're kind of expressing through words and also our thoughts, to doing so with a lot of compassion for ourselves and one another. It's so amazing to have a time to share and reflect ideas on these teachings together and really trying to use that practice of, um, of sharing as, as part of our dharma. So that also it means... Um, you know, when we share, being considerate of what we're sharing, maybe it feels like it's uh, something really important for us, but maybe it would be something difficult for the room to hold. Um, and when we're sharing, you know, being aware that um, there might be some folks with different points of views and ideas. So like really speaking from our own experience, it's a good principle as well. And for those who are listening, you know, really inviting all of us as we listen to do so with as much as possible openness and really being curious about what's happening. It's really important for us that when folks come here and share and connect, they can feel they can do so with that level of compassion. Um, and we're always open for ideas and suggestions of how to make this space feel more compassionate and caring. So please let us know by email, note, um, myself or the other board members and volunteers in the room. Always happy to hear it. So with that, any reflections on the practice or any questions on that practice? Please, do you mind using the microphone? Uh, no, here's the microphone, cool. <laughs> Hi folks, Pamela, sharing. Um, it's I was I was happy that I made it in time for doing the practice and it was interesting to encounter Tonglin. I haven't done a knot in a long time. And um two things about it. One thing is I I often have a bit of a reaction. Um so sometimes I feel like it's presumptive of me to um like decide that someone's suffering mm. it's like i'm always like it kind of like and i'm like I'll, I'll start to see the people maybe who i'm gonna quote do tong lin for and i'm just like this is not maybe they're not suffering maybe that's just my projection mm. on them mm. um so that kind of came up you know and then i was like okay okay well, let's just keep trying on this and um and I, there's a person and I do actually know, cause they've shared with me that in fact, they are, there is suffering and I understand, I'm aware of their suffering. So it was like super shared with me. So I was like, that's cool then. Um, not that it wouldn't be bad to do it. My projection of people's suffering, I think is super relevant also. So that's like another thing, but in this case, I settled down with this person who I know of from direct conversation of their suffering. And it was interesting because um, the quality of the heart space was there, but then I did also begin to notice in the belly an aversion, like mm -hmm. a, a tight. And I was like, oh, so it was like, it was, it was like, I kind of had to back up, you know, because the kind of suffering that person that has expressed to me is actually a suffering that I have an aversive reaction to. Yeah. So it generated that aversive experience or that aversive experience came into my awareness. Um, 
Yeah. Great noticing. Yeah, and, and I think I think you're making an interesting point of would there be anything harmful or wrong if we did Tonglen for someone who's not really suffering? Like, you no, know, probably not. And and I do think the practice absolutely is is for others, but it's really for us in kind of creating that readiness, right? So we are all encountering an enormous amount of suffering if we even look briefly at the news or like walk around these streets, like there's just a lot of suffering. There's no denying. Um, and so how are we meeting that? And I feel like Tonglen like gives us a little training and like slowing down and learning how to, how like essentially like our nervous system can respond to the distress that we can feel in meeting suffering everywhere. So even if we're projecting suffering in order for us to learn how to be with the suffering, I think it has a benefit, right? And, um, you know, I've been, there's so many things in the news, but um, earthquake was really what came to mind to me first. And um, I find it really difficult to engage with the imagery, you know, and I want to put it away. And there might be a wholesome reason to not overly engage with the suffering of the world, but I, I don't want that aversion, you know, like I want that. And it is, it's so interesting, this flash of emptiness, that, that instruction that I heard from Pema Chodron that she learned from Chogyam, which it feels really callous, actually, this idea of like, yeah, those people in the earthquake, they're suffering, but it'll change, you know, things will change, it's moving along, <laughs> you know, like it's, and yet I do know this idea that like, ev like and everything is changing and dynamic. And as you're saying also, like, even what we think is suffering might not be only suffering or always suffering or a solid kind of suffering. The person that I practiced for who I also know is suffering is also not suffering, right? There's other parts. Um, so I think that is, and, you know, in that quote I read, it's just this, this understanding that can allow us that love. Um, it's so interesting. And our understanding of, I think the, the multiplicity Right, of experience too, the, the parts that are hard, the parts that are good. Um, so thanks for that reflection. Yeah. No, not not microphone. Okay. Anyone else? Question or reflection on Tong Glen? Friends online. Okay. Anyone's first Tonglen practice? How was it? That would be great. It won't amplify you. Just let those folks hear you. Um, I think I've done it, but in maybe a little bit like more of a bite size yeah. kind of practice. Um, so that was a lot more intense, I think. And um, just really cool. Like, I feel like it was a little bit transcendental like <laughs> kind of like not quite here all the way like yeah. physically here yeah um and challenging for yeah. sure yeah um just kind of stay with it and that music outside I was kind of like really yeah. like into that it was like the perfect soundtrack <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it was kind of great um but overall really really cool and what was it like when we went back to the body and breath at the end mm. curious did you notice I, kind of challenging to come back and I feel like even after we opened our eyes for the first like a few minutes I was like we're <laughs> like yeah <laughs> cool yeah. yeah I mean I think in a way um you know we think of compassion as a heart practice it is it's also a great concentration practice <laughs> and so that level of like focused attention um can really you know, make us feel what is sometimes called like absorption, you know, the sense of really being within our practice. And so coming out of it can be disorienting. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Thanks. All right. So we are, which chapter? Chapter 18. And I'll start with essentially where we left off earlier. Um, in order to love, it is first necessary to attain clear understanding. It's necessary to live mindfully, 
making direct contact with life in the present moment, truly seeing what is taking in place, what is taking place within and outside of oneself. Practicing mindfulness strengthens the ability to look deeply. And when we look deeply into the heart of anything, it will reveal itself. This is the secret treasure of mindfulness. It leads to the realization of liberation and enlightenment. Life is illuminated by right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Siddhartha called this the noble path. So beautiful in here. Again, just it's really lovely. And, you know, I think, of course, um, you know, we, we don't have direct quotes from the Buddha, but this is very much, I can just feel Thich Nhat Hanh so deeply in, in these phrasings around mindfulness. Practicing mindfulness strengthens the ability to look deeply. And when we look deeply into the heart of anything, it will reveal itself. Anyone have a sense of what that means? Do you, have you had that experience of looking deeply into something and it just reveals itself does does that seem like a mystery or does that seem clear just very beautiful right and um you know i think we can do that it's a lot easier to do that i think in certain conducive settings like we're in the natural world and we just look into a plant or a tree or even the earth and it just opens up and we see wow it's not just this plant it's all these plants it's this incredible network of plants and you know mycelium under the ground um and that sense of of it revealing itself and what is it revealing the interconnection right the ever-changing nature of all things and the interconnection of all things just that same um sense this is the secret treasure of mindfulness it leads to the realization of liberation and enlightenment I, I just love that, um, you know, this clear paying attention to and and really that like gentle paying attention to. I don't know about you all, but the kind of the, the, the <clears throat> translation of right understanding and right thought sounds a little directive. <clears throat> I've heard a teacher say um, wholesome. Right. So a, you know, wholesome understanding, wholesome thought wholesome speech, wholesome action, wholesome livelihood, wholesome effort, wholesome mindfulness and wholesome concentration. And this idea that, you know, it's not as though mindfulness is what we are doing on a cushion with our eyes closed. It's throughout everything we're doing. I think thoughts are the hardest. I don't know about you all, like the others, like, oh, I'm speaking, I'm kind of aware most of the time in my you know daily activities of life. But the thoughts, it's so easy to get carried away by really ruminative, difficult thoughts. Right, um, social media scrolling should have in there. Awesome engagement. Um, you know, when we really, it's, it's just amazing the difference of quality when we're actually attending to what we're doing and not. Looking deeply into the heart of all beings, Siddhartha attained insight into everyone's mind. No matter where they were, he was able to hear everyone's cries of suffering and joy. He attained to the states of divine sight, divine hearing, and the ability to travel across all distances without moving. It was now the end of the third watch, and there was no more thunder. The clouds rolled back to reveal the bright moon. He felt as though a prison which has confined him for thousands of lifetimes had broken open. Ignorance had been the jail keeper. And because of ignorance, his mind had been obscured, like the moon and stars hidden by the storm. Clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts, the mind had falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and others, existence and non-existence, birth and death. And from these discrimination arose wrong views, the prisons of feelings, craving, grasping, and becoming. The only thing to do was to seize the jailkeeper and see his true faith. Face. The jailkeeper was ignorance, and the means to overcome the ignorance was the eight noble eightfold path. Once the jailkeeper was gone, the jail would disappear and never be rebuilt again. So this I kind of love that idea of 
seeing and knowing what is obscuring us, like what's in the way of our awakening and really seeing it as it is, like seeing the true face of it. And once you see the true face of it, never being imprisoned again. I haven't had that experience. <laughs> Every time I go on retreat, I see the jail keepers faces like a lot. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Self-criticism, my old friend or, you know, whatever it is. <clears throat> but I don't seem to be able to like keep the face in mind long enough to break free from the jail. Um, and of course, as last week, you know, almost this entire text is, is pretty, you know, like metaphysics free, but you get these nice little glimpses of like, he knew all the suffering in the world. He could travel everywhere. He could be everywhere. Like these, um, I like to think of it as these kind of exceptional states of pure consciousness. And, you know, they are somewhat documented. There's a really interesting researcher I admire so much, um, a neuroscientist by the name of David Presti. And he is a very well-established um, scientist in his own right. And I think he, he feels like a, a real calling to pointing out that there are all these phenomena of consciousness we can't understand. And there's probably way more that we don't even know about. And he's just talking about the simple thing of, you know, like prescience when you think of someone and they write you a text and you're like, I was just thinking like that happens a lot. That's not like everyone's had that experience. Like one, like there's a lot of things around our consciousness we don't understand. So I'm not saying I necessarily know whether the Buddha could recognize everybody's suffering and joy or transport himself across various lands. But I like being provoked into thinking that there are exceptional states of consciousness. And again, um, for those of us who've been fortunate enough to be in the presence of teachers and beings who've had pretty profound practices and are somewhere close to awake, if not awake, seems as though they have some very different um, capabilities and abilities. And I find that really inspiring. Um, Siddhartha smiled and whispered to himself, oh jailer, I see you now. How many lifetimes have you confined me in the prisons? But now I see your face clearly. And from now on, you can build no more prisons for me. Looking up, Siddhartha saw the morning star appear on the horizon, twinkling like a huge diamond. He had seen the star so many times while sitting beneath the tree, but this morning was like seeing it for the first time. It was as dazzling as the jubilant smile of enlightenment. Siddhartha gazed at the star and exclaimed out of deep compassion. All beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment, and yet we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. He knew he had found the great way, he attained his goal, and his heart experienced perfect peace and ease. He thought about his years of searching, filled with disappointments and hardship. He thought of his father, his mother, his aunt, Yasodahara, Rahula, all his friends. He thought of the palace, his people and country, all those who lived in hardship and poverty, especially children. He promised to find a way to share his discovery to help all others liberate themselves from suffering. Out of this deep insight emerged a profound love for all beings. So I think it's, um, he, has, he has awoken here and uh, his first thoughts are just for all of us, this idea that we contain all the seeds of enlightenment, but we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. Um, yeah. I. I think it's, it is definitely a, a hard, it can be a hard um, shift of our mindset to believe that all of those seeds are already within us and not something we need to earn, to gain, to be good enough to get, but they're already here. And that, you know, what is our own personal jailer? You know, and, and there are a lot of the similarities, right? You know, the greed, the aversion, the grasping, the craving. Um, and I think in our modern context, distraction is such a huge one that can really prevent us from seeing and feeling and having the manifestation of those seeds come to life. Um, 
it's it's quite interesting in this telling of the story of enlightenment we don't have the confrontation with the demon mara and i don't know about you but i felt like a little bit ripped off it's like one of my favorite part of the story of buddha's awakening and i don't know why why he didn't include that story it's definitely on the more metaphysical side and maybe in trying to keep this text accessible for more people it wasn't included um, we're going to talk about it because I just love it. Um, it's so powerful. And, and maybe some of you who've seen um, temples, you know, where there's like Kathmandu or um, many parts in India, it's often a depiction of the Buddha on his night of awakening is this beautiful tree, of course, and by the river. And there'll be, you know, all of these different um, kind of demon like figures around trying to tempt the Buddha. So it said Mara, who's um, kind of this sometimes called the demon of death or just the great um, temptation. He's a, somewhat of an evil force, uh, Mara. And Mara sends first all of his daughters, these beautiful deities to try to tempt the Buddha. And no problem, Buddha is not tempted at all. And then he sends like, all this battalion of soldiers and armies. And it's like, in one telling that I love, they just turn into cherry blossoms, like just falling like flowers at his feet, just like his whole essence, just it can't penetrate him. But the biggest confrontation to Buddha, right, is when Mara says, you know, you have no right to wake up. Hmm. Actually, I should be the one waking up. I should be right there in your place. You know, all of these deities and, you know, other evil demons that have my back. We think that, that I should be here. Why are you here? Who has your back? And some of the readings of this, this phrase, like, and, and this provocation really points out how profound doubt is, mm-hmm. right? And we can be so close to that, which will be so wholesome for us and transformative. And we're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I don't deserve this. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe it isn't my place. And I, I feel very um, tender towards the Buddha that he struggles with doubt. Um, I certainly have a lot of experiences of doubt and know that feeling well. And this is, and we see right here. This is one of the most classic mudras that you see in the Buddha sculpture is where the Buddha is putting his hand on the earth, touching the earth and said, the earth is my witness. And just such a beautiful part of this book that, you know, all of these chapters has woven in is the Buddha's relationship with the natural world. You know, we, again, and a lot of our contemporary forms of Buddhism, it, we go on retreat and usually there's nice trees there, but we're not talking about the natural world quite so intensely um, as we see in this book. I mean, the natural world, him being underneath the rose apple tree when he is starting to have these first inklings of awakening as an eight-year-old boy. You know, when he goes into the forest, relieving everything and the forest is really like his first teacher um, with his, you know, no shoes whatsoever, walking everywhere. And then, of course, here he is under this pipala tree and it's like surrounded by this tree and held by the earth. And the earth kind of quakes underneath him when he says the earth is my witness and it rises up for him. I I just find that so beautiful and moving. And that's when, you know, here it says the kind of thunder and lightning receded. And that's when in these other tellings of that awakening story, it comes up. Um, I'd be curious from folks who I'm sure have heard this awakening story. Has that part felt inspiring to you or what else about that night of awakening? Um, Yeah, kind of is resonant, especially the earth coming up not something i hear folks talk about that often Uh uh-huh jason yeah i am i don't know what to say except yes you know i i know the the mara is an essential kind of thing that i've i know you know it's like no knowing the doubt and knowing the power of doubt and the way you've 
the way you've talked about it actually um, just, it really resonates with me around a number of things. And I think that it's, it's the moment of, of reckoning with that doubt that is the triumph or, you know, whatever we're talking about. I think it's like, it's, it's really um, ephemeral what we're talking about. And mm -hmm. I feel like the, um, the grounding that, that gesture is so, yeah. I, I did that for a while too. I was like, I'm just going to do that every day. I'm just going to touch the ground. Yeah. And I was like, yep. wow, you know, it really is quite a thing to, to do as a practice because it's not in my normal routine. I don't, I mean, it's enough to just sit and try to get my feet to stay in one place for a sit um, or my butt, you know, just like just sitting on a cushion without agitating and fidgeting. Yeah. And so just that idea that like, yeah, touch the ground. So I, I, I really am glad you're emphasizing that because it's, it's the one thing in that story that really resonates with me. Like I've, I know that they, is Mara also the hindrances? Is Mara also the embodiment of everything that is unwholesome? Right. That's yeah. what, that's what I've come to believe, at least. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And yeah, I do think, and it's so powerful if you get to sit outside. Um, I got to sit actually under a redwood tree this weekend, and just that like richness of the earth. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, Mara doesn't go away after this night of enlightenment, you know, and kind of the other more famous time when Mara comes back and there's this, you know, I think it's Ananda who's like really like concerned, like, no, Mara, you don't get to see Buddha. Um, and Mara has this amazing debate with like Ananda around like, why don't I get to see the Buddha? He's like, oh, because, you know, you, you're not a friend of the Buddha. And he's like, oh, Buddha has enemies. And, you know, it's like really like provoking um, his way in and, and this, you know, saying of Buddha saying, like, I see you, Mara. So not trying to avoid, not trying to deny. And then we're getting a little bit towards that feeding your demons of inviting Mara in for tea, like really welcoming and bringing it forward. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a, a limit on the amount of Mara we can have on our lives, but I love that idea of like both seeing Mara and meeting Mara and like using, could be literal ground, but like, what is our ground? What is our, where do we go? Especially when that sense of doubt or insecurity arises, like what feels like our ground? Ideally, it would be our true nature. You know, those very seeds of enlightenment, that very sense of our deepest intrinsic okayness, um, that true refuge. So, yeah. I, think I want to I ask one question. Can I ask one more oh, question please. about Mara, which yeah. is, you know, Mara, Mara is in a sense a very violent, you know, I, the sort of soldiers always felt violent, but, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm, curious about is is it more sort of um psychological or physical it's just a kind of a, a subtlety but also the um the sense of what what is it when confronted with a mara like moment what are the tools that we have to like no oh this look there's mara right what are the yeah. tools that we have to pause to stop and to not go into really defensiveness or doubt or whatever. Cause I, I think that that's what I'm trying to cultivate. And I, I'm a novice. I don't know how to do that. You know, so I'm I, yes, for you're very humble. Um, I'd say that, uh, you probably already are practicing, you know, like in general, broadly speaking, we could call Mara, you know, negative rumination, you know, some of the ways, if, especially if you think about doubt, I mean, there's many forms and faces I'd say of Mara, but, let's say that negative rumination or kind of um, self-criticism. And often that's happening outside of our conscious awareness. And so I think one of the most powerful things meditation does is develop our meta awareness, being able to notice what our thoughts and emotions are as they're happening. They're not just kind of going on in the background <clears throat> without us noticing. And, you know, I think the tool, like you're saying, like, what's the pause? Like the pausing is great. Um, and 
there are so many different tools that I think help at different times. But one, you know, the powerful ones is, is our reappraisal, our ability to like label and identify, oh, that's doubt, that's fear, that's insufficiency, or like, that's not my stuff, or like, that's their stuff, right? Just our calling it out. And then like, what's the other way that we are with it? And that might be, you know, I see you, Mara. It might be like a phrase that we can use. Um, that might be literally whatever is grounding. So it might be touching the heart, not touching the actual ground. Um, but I really think, you know, as, as the, as the story shows us, you know, Siddhartha just kept saying, there's no way for us to progress on the path without training the mind. And it's not because like you're become so smart training the mind. It's because otherwise you're never going to know when actually you're living in Mara's world <laughs> and like Mara's running everything. You're not going to notice that that's all like operating behind unless you start to train your mind and start to feel those shifts of perception and those shifts of um, experience. I mean, it's amazing. I think last week I was sharing how, you know, waking up in the moment to realizing, wow, I've been stressed out and anxious the last hour and really like not, not even noticing. And I'd be like, Oh, okay. All right. You know, it's, it is, can be really hard to not, um, have like we were, you know, last week we talked a lot about ignorance and, you know, just not seeing clearly things as they are not noticing, being so distracted, so deluded that we just can't recognize what's going on. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Diane, was there other, I saw some stuff on the chat there. Anything worth sharing yeah, to the definitely, group? Definitely, Maria is here and she says, I own a bonsai business and my bonsai practice has been so interwoven with my spiritual practice around the trees and the earth and the literal groundedness of trees and the huge role mm. that they play in our lives and in Buddhism. Mm. It's super powerful and poignant for me. I have a Buddha doing the touching the earth mudra in my storefront and center. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think I shared this before, but um, Lama Sultram Alioni, who's one of uh, Lopan Chandra's main teachers, shared with me that, you know, in some interpretations, that tree that the Buddha is under is actually a, a yakshini, which is a female deity tree spirit. Um, and she was saying that there's just so much sacred feminine in the Buddha's awakening, um, which I, I think is a, a lovely way to think of, you know, being held in the natural world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And like, <clears throat> since we aren't all of us doing our practice under the tree all the time. Like what is our sense of being held in the natural world or like, how can we bring that in? We have these beautiful plants here. Um, but even that sense, sometimes when we're here together um, meditating, you know, just bringing in like um, walking here tonight um, with Tig and just the color of the sky. It's like exceptional and we're not under it. Thank God it's really cold out tonight. Um, but imagining and remembering like there's a sky above us. There's that earth below us, like really building in that connection to our practice can be that ground as well. So, beautiful. Okay. So Buddha woke up, we did Mara. Um, so the first thing that happens is, um, Svasti, this wonderful buffalo boy who's been bringing the Buddha, you know, the grass he's been laying on at night. Just then, Svasti appeared. When Siddhartha saw the young buffalo boy come running towards him, he smiled. Suddenly, Svasti stopped in his tracks and stared at Siddhartha, his mouth wide open. Siddhar Siddhartha called Svasti. The boy came to his senses and answered, Teacher. And Svasti joined his palms and bowed. He took a few steps forward, but stopped and gazed at Siddhartha in awe. Embarrassed by his own behavior, he spoke haltingly, teacher, you look so different today. And Siddhartha motioned for the boy to approach. He took him into his arms and asked, how do I look different today? And gazing up at Siddhartha, Svasti answered, it's hard to say, you look so different. It's like you were a star. <laughs> um, you look like a lotus that's just blossomed and the moon over the peak Siddhartha looked in Svasti's eyes and said why you're a poet Svasti now tell me why are you here 
Um, and anyway, the big rainstorm had happened and Swasti was very worried about um, Siddhartha. And um, he then asked that the that Swasti go and bring all the children together so that his very first teaching um, in finding the way would be a teaching towards towards the children. And it's really sweet, you know, this first um, this first kind of week or two of his teaching, he's really intent on being able to offer something that's so simple that, um, you know, un, not formally educated children from this village can understand it. Um, and the children are his first gathering um, of students. It's so sweet. And so those of you who are familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh or have ever seen him, there's always so many children around, you know, in the practice and like a really lovely energy there. And um, one of the first um, things he talks about with these children is because they're having kind of a celebration lunch together is, is mindful eating. And he says, when you, Peel a tangerine. You can eat it with awareness or without awareness. What does it mean to eat a tangerine in awareness? When you're eating the tangerine, you are aware you're eating the tangerine. You fully experience its lovely fragrance and sweet taste. And when you peel the tangerine, you know that you're peeling the tangerine. When you remove a slice and put it in your mouth, you know you're removing the slice and putting it in your mouth. When you experience the lovely fragrant, fragrance and sweet taste of the tangerine, you're aware of the experience and the lovely fragrance. The tangerine had nine sections. I ate each morsel in awareness and saw how precious and wonderful it was. I did not forget the tangerine, and thus the tangerine became something very real to me. If the tangerine is real, the person eating it is real. That is what it means to eat a tangerine in awareness. What does it mean to eat a tangerine without awareness? It means you don't know you're eating it. You don't experience the fragrance. When you peel it, you don't know you're peeling it. When you remove a slice and put it in your mouth, you don't know you're removing a slice and putting it in your mouth. You don't smell. You don't know that you are smelling. The fragrance um, and tasting is lost. Eating a tangerine in such a way, you cannot appreciate its precious and wonderful nature. If you're not aware of the tangerine, um, of the tangerine, it is not real. And if it is not real, the person eating it is not real. Eating the tangerine in mindfulness means that while eating, you are truly in touch with it. Your mind is not chasing after thoughts of yesterday or tomorrow, but dwelling fully in the present moment. The tangerine is truly present. Living in mindful awareness means to live in the present moment, your mind and body dwelling in the here and now. And he kind of goes on to just start teaching around what mindfulness can really bring us. And um, some of you may be familiar. There's a, a beautiful uh, kind of long practice that Thich Nhat Hanh has on how to eat mindfully. Uh, it's on his website. You can download it. And a lot of it is that presence with all the sensory parts, but also it's the appreciation and the recognition of interdependence that brings the tangerine forth. And it's just like that, you know, deeply looking into something and having it reveal itself, mm -hmm. you know, like that, how do we make something? I just like the phrasing, make it real mm -hmm. so that we're real. Mm -hmm. And I think about all the unreal meals I've eaten, like over my computer, <laughs> especially. And it just, it's true. It's like, you're kind of nourished, like you're no longer hungry but there's not that sense of fullness, you know, and not stomach fullness, but like presence fullness. Um, and it's tough, right? I think it's, it's interesting to focus on, you know, this basic aspect of food, right? We all need food to come into our body. We all make space for it. And then to bring mindful awareness to it, to make it real. It is, it's a beautiful first teaching. So yeah, just appreciating it. And, um, um, I'll just say this one last part here. He says, the path I have found is the path of living each hour of the day in awareness, mind and body always dwelling in the present moment. The opposite is to live in forgetfulness. If we live in forgetfulness, we do not know we are alive. We do not know we are fully experienced in life because our mind and body are not dwelling in the here and now.
it's a nice aspiration to think of how much more we can invite ourselves to really fully live in our present moments. Um, it's so unbelievably easy not to arguably like easier than ever. Um, I actually remember being bored as a kid. I'm not sure if that happens anymore. You know, so much stimulation and possibility and potential. Um, and it is, it's such a radical act to like be here now. It really is. It's quite amazing. So with that, we can close a little dedication of our time together here. giving ourselves a couple moments to dwell in the present moments. And feeling the fullness of our presence here and the fullness of our presence together in this shared space. And if it feels comfortable placing hands together at the heart as a gesture to offer up this practice and this time together, and consider that any benefit of our time together could radiate out like that light at our heart and benefit all beings, beings near and being far so that all beings would know their own true nature. All beings would be connected to a sense of happiness and well-being. That each and every being could be free. So oh, great to be with you all. Mace is going to give us some announcements here.